Hello and welcome to uh, our June Archaeology Speaker Series. Um, the Office of State Archaeology hosts speakers each month uh, to present research on archaeological uh, investigations in the state and around the region. Uh, all lectures are free and open to the public and will be archived afterwards on the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources YouTube channel. Uh, it's my honor uh, today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anna Agby Davies. Uh, Dr. Agby Davies is a historical archaeologist who specializes in uh, plantation societies in the colonial southeast, uh, as well as the African diaspora, among other topics. She attended the College of William and Mary as an undergraduate and completed her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, where she uh, examined locally made clay tobacco pipes from rural and urban sites in and around Jamestown, Virginia. She was also a staff archaeologist at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's Department of uh, Archaeological Research and was also previously an assistant professor at DePaul University. Anna currently serves as associate professor at, uh, for the Department of Anthropology at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, but she also has appointments with the archaeology curriculum uh, as well as the Department of African and African American Diaspora Studies. A hallmark of Dr. Agby Davies's ongoing work has been her efforts to build collaborations with local community stakeholders, as well as uh, promote public archaeology programs. Today, Dr. Agby Davies will present her paper, paper entitled The Archaeology of the Polymurray House. Please welcome Dr. Anna Agby Davies. Thank you, Dr. Cranford, for that kind introduction and also for the invitation to speak today. Thank you all for, for coming to hear what I have to say about our work at the Polly Murray House and hello to everybody in internet land. Welcome to you as well. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today um, will focus primarily on Mm, ongoing research. This is a project that we're several years into, but we have several years yet to go. So this is really a snapshot of where things stand in 2019. Uh, I hope that I'll be able to give you some enticing hints of what we've discovered already, and then uh, point towards the directions that I hope this research will go in the next uh, coming years. So first I'm going to try to say as little as possible about the magnificent legacy of Polly Murray and the important influence she has had on the region and on the country, and then um, address the genesis of the project, why we decided to do archaeology at her childhood home, which is in Durham, North Carolina. Then I'm going to present some results in terms of field work, what did we discover while we were actually uh, undertaking the excavation? What did we find while we were actually in the field doing our work? That work is completed for now. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, artifact analysis. That's ongoing, and in fact, I have a wonderful research assistant working with me this summer who is uh, bringing the artifacts into a database that will allow us to do many more analyses than the ones I'm able to show you here today. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about work that I've done trying to situate the home in the larger landscape, the landscape of the neighborhood, the landscape of Durham, and kind of the landscape of broader African America as we understand it through a variety of sources. Most of the information I've drawn on for that is archival uh, maps, census data, things like that. And then, if I have time, I'm going to talk a little bit about where this work is going and how it fits into my larger research program and some of the comparative work that I hope to do with these materials. So, Polly Murray came to uh, live at 906 Carroll Street in Durham, um, the home of her grandparents when her mother passed away when she was quite small, and she came to live with her aunt, who was also living in the family home at the time. So she lived in what we now call the Polly Murray family home um, from the time that she was a little more than a toddler until she graduated from high school when she went on to pursue her education in New York City. But this is the home that's most uh, closely associated with her and where she spent the longest uh, sort of continuous stretch of time during her life. She moved quite a bit as an adult. The home where Polly Murray grew up really matters along a variety of dimensions, and I think the one that's most important that we should mention first was her tremendous contribution to human rights. Uh, I don't have the, the luxury of time to tell you all of the important things that she has done, but she's best known for her championing 
racial equality and gender equality. Um, and she did this in her professional capacity as an attorney, as a professor and a writer, and also through her personal life. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing that we can uh, attribute to her and, and one of the reasons why her home is so significant. It's the place where a lot of her values were formed growing up, right? Uh, if you want to know much more about Polly Murray, I urge you to go to the website of the Polly Murray Project, which is pollymurrayproject.org, um, and find out about the amazing work that's being done to continue her legacy. So that's one reason that her home is significant. Um, the social scientist in me is very interested in using this as an opportunity to find out more about a particular time and a particular place that we don't have a lot of archaeological information for. And so, in some sense, Polly Murray's home stands in for um, 20th century Durham, African America during the era of Jim Crow. There are themes and topics that we can address um, because we have the opportunity to examine her home archaeologically. Polly Murray was um, exceptional in many ways. She broke a lot of barriers. And I think these are some of the reasons that um, her house is now on the National Register, right? So that um, the, her historic significance, her contributions to American history and culture are um, recognized for that reason. And again, because she's so closely associated with that place, that's why we want to preserve and protect it and also let people know more about her and her life. And then finally, again, from the social scientist perspective, um, as Dr. Cranford mentioned, my area of training and expertise is in colonial era archaeology. Be but be I've become increasingly interested in what we can do using the tools of archaeology to understand uh, contemporary society, what it means to do the archaeology of the 20th century. And so this has been a really exciting opportunity for me to think about how to um, use the tools and the training that I have to explore a completely different time period than I ever imagined that I would um, be investigating. So it's, a, it's a, a moment to kind of push archaeological method and theory. For my talk today, I'm really going to be focusing in the upper right-hand quadrant, just talking about some of the findings that we have. But I hope you'll keep these other areas of significance in mind, and maybe we can talk about them in the Q&A at the end. So how did I get involved? This is a picture of my first visit to the Polly Murray family home back in 2011. And Barbara Lau, the director of the Polly Murray Project, is shown here in the backyard. And we are looking at Maplewood Cemetery, which is immediately behind the home and was kind of the reason that I was brought into this project. Um, Barbara Lau mentioned that the city of Durham was going to do some much needed uh, waste, uh, stormwater management related to the cemetery, and um, folks at the project wanted to make sure that any archaeological materials that could contribute to what we know about Polly Murray would not be uh, damaged in that process. So um, we monitored the um, sort of rerouting of the, of the drainage system of the cemetery, and uh, the work there did not impact significant archaeological resources. But of course, it really piqued my interest. And it introduced me to Polly Murray, somebody who I was not aware of before, before that time. And so when the time came to do some restoration on the house, again, that would, that would disturb uh, underground deposits, uh, Barbara Lau contacted me and asked me to um, find a way to do some archaeology, again, to ensure that in the process of protecting the building, we didn't destroy the archaeological evidence. And I was very happy to be involved in that. This is the house after um, much of the modern uh, material that had been added to it over the years had been taken away, but before the restoration. Okay. So that's kind of how, how this all began. I'll say that, uh, look, so I'm going to talk now some about the survey and excavation discoveries. The, um, I think the most visible um, part of the home's story and the story of Polly Murray living in the home is the relationship between the house and the cemetery. I'm sure you remember from the previous slide that the cemetery is upslope from the hill and 
Ever since its um, establishment, it has been shedding water into and under and through the home of uh, the Fitzgeralds and Polly Murray. And in fact, she offers this really evocative description that I'm going to take the time to read to you because she's such a brilliant writer and I just want to give you a taste of her literary style. The graves crept closer and the water from decomposed bodies drained over our property. Our well was condemned. During bad weather, we were mired in from constant floodings which settled under the house and rotted the foundations of the stable and well shed. We had to slosh around in boots most of the time. Our house sank lower and lower and the walls began to crack. So you get a sense of the kind of the looming presence of this cemetery and how the indifference perhaps to put it kindly, or perhaps the active um, effort to um, basically enact a, an act of environmental racism against this African-American family um, had an immense impact on Polly Murray's understanding of um, equal rights and the importance of speaking truth to power. So, we see significant evidence not only of the flooding, excuse me, but also of efforts to address it. And we discovered that um, initially through a process of excavating shovel test pits. Now, for those of you who are not archaeologists, what we do often when encountering a new site is dig a series of small holes at regular intervals that allow us to sample the artifacts to get a sense of um, when the various deposits across the site might date to and what kinds of activities they might represent, and also to examine the layers to try to determine if um, the site has been disturbed recently, if the layers alternatively might be in very um, regular order, and that will allow us to examine change over time at the site. Um, it'll give us a chance to identify some features that we might want to examine in further detail. And so what we found when we went and did these shovel test pits is that this area here has been pretty heavily impacted. There's really nothing dating to the period of Polly Murray's um, or her family's occupation that remains in that area. We did find, however, um, a lot of artifacts back here and hints at some really interesting brick features that we wanted to look more closely at, places where bricks were not just lying loose in the soil, but had been built, built into something that was then buried, and we wanted to have a look at that. We also found some really wonderful preservation of features and deposits in this area, and then um, uh, the remnants of a fence post over here. So we were, we were really beginning to get a sense of the landscape in which uh, Polly Murray grew up, and we had a sense of how we might begin to approach it um, with larger excavation units that would give us a sort of a bigger perspective rather than these tiny keyholes um, into the past. Um, let's see. So that, like I said, guided the placement of the larger excavation units. So this is showing a series of excavations from 2016 to 2018. We began by focusing, because the initial uh, field work was prompted by the restoration of the house itself, sorry, um, we were working, looking at the piers underneath the house that were about to be replaced and determined that in fact the, the water movement was such that there were no intact deposits under the house. There was no need to do further um, archaeological work under there. Uh, before the foundation could be rebuilt. <coughs> we also examined uh, the area where the shed addition had stood in order to understand um, what might be impacted when that was reconstructed in the future. And then in 2017, we followed up on some of those interesting brick features that we had identified, and they were kind of we, we couldn't figure out if they were individual items or if there was something larger, and of course it was the something larger, which we found out in 2018 when we dug um, a larger trench across the whole area uh, to fully expose the uh, part of the site that will be pretty heavily impacted by uh, the reconstruction of that shed addition. Okay. 
And so here are some of the features that we came across on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see this area of brick paving that runs the full length of the shed addition and um, is very clearly designed to kind of shed water away from the house and into this drainage ditch that continued to be maintained. It, we have evidence that it silted in, people scooped it out, it silted in, people scooped it out. So it's constantly trying to pull water away from the house and down slope to the south away from the foundation. Um, this brick, because it's been basically waterlogged for 100 years, um, is in very poor shape. And we've decided that the best way to preserve the information that it gives us was to record it extensively, including a, a 3D um, photo reconstruction that we're looking forward to sharing with, with people in the coming years. Um, this other feature, the one on the right-hand side, I'm just gonna back up a little bit to show you where it's located. It's located right here, and what this appears to be is a drain, again, shedding water away from the house, sort of down and away, to try to deal with the um, erosion issues that the family faced over the years. So you can see that this, um, relationship between the cemetery and the property was really, um, really formative, um, both in an archaeological sense and, I would argue, in, um, in a social or emotional sense for Polly Murray, experiencing growing up in that home and in those environs. Okay. Let's see. Oh, and one last thing that's kind of an interesting note. Um, Polly Murray's grandfather, Robert Fitzgerald, was a professional. He was a teacher for much of his adult life, but he was also a brick maker. So we've got um, not only evidence of the family um, addressing the environmental racism that they were facing, but also um, using materials that kind of spoke to his other professional life as a brick maker um, in the city of Durham. Okay, so that's what we've sort of, that's a, in the nutshell, what we've discovered from the excavation itself. Now I'm gonna turn to some of the artifact analysis. And like I said, this is hot off the presses and very preliminary, so um, bear with me here. Um, one of the things that I intend to do with the artifact analysis going forward is to join this material with uh, material that I've recovered from an excavation that I did at the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls in Chicago. And part of that is because of the areas of overlap and then the areas of contrast between the two sites. Um, I maybe will say a little bit more about what those areas of comparison and contrast are. But um, for one thing, this is a site, again, associated with African-American residents. Um, but being in Chicago, it offers some interesting contrasts with a site in Durham. And we'll speak more about the others in a moment. Um, so, one of the first things that I've been able to do now that um, my research assistant, William Ragland, has, has um, sort of integrated all the artifact databases and standardized all of, the, um, all of the categories is we can now look at the different materials that are recovered from the site. And I was curious to do a comparison with the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls. I had a notion that they would be different in a number of ways. And I was initially thinking that this might have something to do with um, waste disposal practices, different uh, kinds of materials that enter the archaeological record. I feel like in the 20th century, you're maybe not dealing with different degrees of access to material, but how people chose to discard it would be really significant for the archaeological record. What I'm actually starting to see, and, and by the way, these are statistically different proportions of all these different classes of, of material. What, um, what I am seeing here, though, now that I had the opportunity to generate these very basic comparisons, is that you see a lot of difference in the area of um, building materials, right? The Polly Murray family home is a wooden structure. The Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls is a brick structure. I think there's... Um, much, much more to be done than this very simple comparison of material types. But it kind of gives you a sense that um, although these sites um, are contemporaneous, although they're both the homes of African American families, or not families, but African Americans, and that um, 
we have uh, predominantly women living in both of these uh, sites, uh, there's still some important differences to explore. One class of artifacts that we've had the opportunity to do a more analysis with are the ceramics, both from the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls and the Polly Murray Family Home. These are some artifacts from the Polly Murray Family Home um, that show you the kinds of, of ceramics that we're recovering there. And we do have some um, interesting differences, just that we're in the process of doing the Crossmen's reconstructing vessels from the Polly Murray family home. So most of what I can say right now is based on shirt level, just based on the fragments that we see. But it does appear that there's a real difference between the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls and the Polly Murray family home in terms of the types of ceramics, in terms of uh, tablewares and teawares, uh, the variety and the quantity that are present, and also the um, the uh, numbers of fragments from any individual vessel. So we have a lot of one-offs from the Polly Murray family home, it looks like. And so this, again, speaks to perhaps refuse disposal practices, but also probably to the different functions of these two houses. So one is a family home, as the name suggests. Also, um, the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls um, was not only a residence, but was also kind of a social venue. So you have a lot of people coming through, a lot of dining and tea drinking happening, and so the and the archaeological assemblage seems to reflect that, which is which is always fun. Um, and then I think there are also some interesting questions having to do with with class that can be addressed uh, going forward. But as I hinted, one of the things that I think makes these two sites really comparable is the, is the predominance of women at these sites. And this is uh, just a timeline to, sh to show you who was at the Polly Murray family home when. And um, as you can see, from the time that Polly Murray arrived, her grandfather was mainly the, the only man who was living in the house. And um, he spent a significant amount of time in a um, home for wounded soldiers in Hampton, so he was not necessarily um, there all of the time that she was growing up before, um, before he passed away. So this whole question of what, it, what does it mean to look at a site that is predominantly uh, created by women is an interesting question. One of the ways that I'm beginning to uh, attack this question is thinking about um, artifacts related to dress. I ran across a really, um, a really interesting quote that was attributed to RuPaul, and I don't know if it's accurate, but um, it goes something along the lines of, like, we're born naked, everything else is drag, right? And I think that's actually a really accurate representation of how important clothing is for presenting um, our notions of our gendered selves to the rest of the world. Okay? And because that's an important tool that we use and agree on as, as a significant um, indicator of what we think about our own gender, um, that means that the artifacts associated with that can be really, um, really powerful research materials. Okay? So I'm just beginning to figure out how to think about this. Um, but I started with um, buttons because uh, you will find that the buttons designed for men's clothing and the buttons designed for women's clothing um, are quite different in form and easily recognizable. So this is a, a test project that I did with just the material from the, um, the trench in the back of the house. So I need to repeat this with the remaining artifacts from the site. But what I discovered is I looked at, you know, let me reorient you guys, sorry for the non-archaeologists in the room. This is a diagram of the different layers and deposits at the site. Every layer, every test pit, every trench will have its own unique number, and they're represented by a box on the diagram. In some cases, layers that uh, extended across several units, they'll be lumped together in one of these larger boxes. So this is basically representing all of the layers at the site. This is the topsoil and the most recent material, 
And this is the very bottom. This is where um, we no longer find any evidence of human activity. So we're going in time from today to way, way back. Okay, so I looked at how the buttons were distributed across the site and um, comparing the types of buttons that you'll see on like men's shirts or work pants, things like that, and their distribution through the different layers, and then compared them with buttons that are typically um, a part of women's clothing, either you know, colorful dress buttons or coat buttons. And uh, you find some of each across all the different layers, but there's a statistically di significant difference between what we see in the topsoil and what we see in what archaeologists call sealed contexts. So context layers that um, we can pinpoint to a specific point in time and have not been recently disturbed. Okay? And what we're seeing is um, disproportionately more men's clothing buttons in the very uppermost layers in the most recent deposits and um, more buttons that would be attached to women's clothing in the older deposits, ones that are more likely to be associated with the time that Polly Murray and her family were living there. Okay. So that's kind of cool, right? It reinforces kind of our understanding of the site chronology. Um, it's an interesting way to try and look at who was where, when. But of course, this notion of um, what these buttons represent is not entirely unproblematic. And it's especially drawn to our attention um, at this site because we know that from a very young age, Polly Murray preferred to wear the kind of clothing that was designed for boys, and even as an adult, often wore clothing that was designed for men. And it seems from her notes, she didn't feel that there was a correspondence between her body and who she was. And so saying that all of these buttons, shirt buttons that come from men's clothing equal men, at any site that's kind of a problematic argument, but at this site especially so. Likewise, I think it would be pretty simplistic to say, oh, we've got these men's clothing buttons from this early time period. That's representing Polly Murray's decision to wear clothing designed for men. I think that's maybe a step better, but still not addressing the nuances of what we need to figure out. So this, this is what I'm turning over in my head. Like I've got some patterns, but I'm not quite sure what to do with them yet. But I think it's really exciting. And it's because of who Polly Murray was that I think I've been confronted with this as a problem rather than just kind of skating through it and proceeding on to the next analysis. Okay, so this is something that I'm, I'm really interested in pursuing further. <coughs> Another direction that I want to take the artifact analysis is um, there are some really marvelous surveys, um, two in particular, one in 1905 and one in 1930, of African American homes in Durham. Right? So we have archival evidence of what social science researchers coming into people's homes recorded when they uh, visited these people. Um, these are just, you know, stock pictures of, of the kinds of things that they described in people's homes. They're not uh, specific to um, those studies or to Polly Murray. But I think this is going to be a really interesting opportunity to think about um, how uh, this home compares with the others that surround it. It's going to be a really interesting examination of class and how that relates to consumption. Um, you know, I think we're all familiar with the idea of conspicuous consumption from Veblen. Well, there's, um, I think, really good evidence that uh, the kind of conspicuous consumption that we are conditioned to look for in the archaeological record may not necessarily apply or be the best indicator of um, a family's class that, um, that we've often assumed it is. So I'm curious to take information from these home surveys to think through the relationship between the Murray Fitzgerald home and the rest of the city. So now I'm kind of broadening, I'm scaling back to show the family home within the city of Durham. So I don't know how easy this is for you to see, but this is a Sanborn map. I've circled the family home and the lot that it sits in. And I hope you can at least 
see that it's fairly densely settled around them. When, when Robert Fitzgerald built the house um, around the turn of the century, it was way out in the country. It was outside the city limits of Durham, but Durham grew and grew and grew and kind of engulfed the house. Um, so this is what it looked like in 1913, a year before Polly Murray arrived. And you can see all of these houses in the area. And in her uh, family history, Polly Murray describes kind of the, the relationship or the contrast that her family felt between themselves and their neighbors. And she describes um, sitting on, on the porch and feeling like she was kind of surrounded by this neighborhood, but not necessarily a part of it. Um, that is, I think, partially physiographic. You can't see from this map, but the slope of the cemetery kind of continues down. So the house is actually on a little terrace, and then the rest of the neighborhood is lower in elevation, hence the name, the bottoms, that they gave to it. Um, but there's also a bit of a social separation. Uh, the Fitzgeralds were a professional family. The women were teachers and nurses. Um, Robert Fitzgerald was a teacher himself. Um, most of the people living in these homes looking at the census record, I think that's the next slide, yeah. These are people working in the tobacco factories, um, working in domestic service, um, almost entirely renters, unlike um, Pauline Dame in the 1930 census who's an owner. Right, so you have some important class distinctions that um, I think need to be confronted, but I think it's also important to realize that um, this experience, again, probably informed Polly Murray's understanding of social justice. And the conditions that are described in the bottoms are not great. And I think her um, exposure to and understanding of the inequalities that she experienced even within the African American community itself um, galvanized her pursuit of social justice. So let's see, what did I want to talk about here? Okay, this is just to give you a sense of the, of the range of documents that are available to talk about this question of landscape. And let's see. Okay, so in 1937, you've got even more housing surrounding the Polly Murray family home. It's still the same mix of um, people doing domestic labor or um, uh, industrial labor in factories, some craftsmen, but not many professionals and not many homeowners. And so you see a, a decrease in the, in the number of owners um, during this time period. And you also see uh, rapid turnover of families, okay? and. These are the kinds of conditions that, um, starting in the 1930s, people like um, the sociologist whose who's study that I'm referencing uh, from UNC, uh, they're concerned with uh, the conditions faced by renters in these homes and are deeming these houses inadequate. Um, what happens though, there, there are consequences for these kinds of judgments. And so this is a, a map of what's called neighborhood security. It's basically a map of where mortgages and insurance policies will be um, considered a good financial risk. And then you can only imagine that it corresponds rather neatly to the map of where non-white households are living in the city of Durham. So that you've got um, families who are constrained in where they can live, um, but furthermore do not have access to the kinds of financial tools to change their circumstances, right? They are unable to get mortgages to buy houses, so they continue to rent houses that are increasingly not in very good condition, uh, and they're unable to insure their property. So the structural elements that are enforcing the kind of inequality that continues to exist today, right, are, um, very evident here in Durham, and this is something that I'm interested in exploring in further detail. Another part of the landscape that I wanna talk about um, has to do with water, not the water that's eroding 
uh, from the cemetery into the Polly Murray family home, but municipal water in the city of Durham. So this is a map of sanitary facilities and the proportion of houses that have adequate sanitation according to the standards of the survey. Adequate sanitation is defined as having running water connected to a flush toilet and a bathtub. So here is the block where the Polly Murray family home is located. And what this map is telling us is that, let's see, if I have it written down here, it's difficult to read. I think it's saying 80 to 90 percent of households on that block do not have um, adequate sanitation according to those standards. Okay? Um, and this is something that was true um, more so for renters, but also in 1940 was true for a quarter of owner-occupied homes in the city of Durham. So um, when you have sociologists and other observers coming through and saying that the difficulties that people are facing are because they are maladjusted to life in the city, that they're coming from the country and are, and are unable to use city services in an appropriate way, and that's part of the root of their problem. Um, that's, a, that's a statement that doesn't acknowledge the fact that these services are not necessarily being extended to the areas that these people are living in. Let me give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, these are, again, the Sanborn maps from uh, 1913 and 1937. And what I've highlighted with the stars are the location of, um, of fire hydrants. Right? The origin of municipal water in Durham was not about sanitation or about drinking water, but it was about fire suppression. Um, and what you see in 1913 is that the closest access points are you know, more than two blocks away from the location of the family home. And in fact, that's probably why there's a burned out home just down, the, just down the street from them. Um, when you look at 1937, the, the city water is, is coming closer, but um, these conditions in which people are living that are judged to be inadequate are, again, not a factor of choices that they are able to make, but have to do with infrastructure and uh, structural um, decisions that are being made at a much higher level. So these are some of the things that I'm thinking about with reference to the Polly Murray family home and how it fits into the landscape. I'm becoming very interested in uh, infrastructure and uh, governmentality, you know, to use an anthropological phrase. Okay, so what's next? Like I said, I'm connecting this work with um, the work that I'm doing at the, Poly, at the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls um, and thinking about it in terms of the work of what in the early part of the 20th century would be called race women. These are women who are um, using their position to better the conditions of African American people in this country and often doing it from a very gendered framework. So women are taking care of children, they are running charities, they are um, not doing this from uh, the legislature or from the boardroom, but they're using their authority in the home and their authority as caretakers and nurturers and moral guides to create a better life for African Americans in this country, especially during the era of Jim Crow. So women like Cooper and Williams and Terrell um, were known in their era for their good works and their efforts to improve the lot of African Americans. And I put the women who founded the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls um, in, this, in this category, and I'm thinking about the connections between the type of work that Polly Murray was doing and the type of work that these women were doing um, in an interesting comparative way. Mm. What scholars in other disciplines are beginning to think through is not only the, the works of these women, but the words of these women, because they weren't only um, people who did good things, but they, they were speakers and writers and to some extent philosophers and social scientists. And one of the areas of overlap that I'm especially interested in exploring is the connection between the kind of work that the women of the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls were doing and the kind of work that Polly Murray was doing 
and this um, sort of intellectual philosophical movement called pragmatism. And in a nutshell, what pragmatism is all about is um, experiential inquiry, right? Not using first principles, but actually going out and gathering data and finding out what in fact is going on. And then using that knowledge for social justice, not just to put it on a shelf and to um, pat yourself on the back, but to take that information and do something worthwhile with it. Um, and finally, to have a sense that it's the, it's the consequences of the thing that matter um, more so than, than abstract principles. So all these ideas of pragmatism are familiar from the work of people like John Dewey and Jane Addams and W.B. Du Bois, and I think the work of these race women is kind of part and parcel with this intellectual movement in the early part of the 20th century. So, um, and the visionary pragmatism part comes from sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, and I just want to read her description of this um, term that she's come up with. She says, visionary pragmatism links caring theoretical vision with informed practical struggle. And this, I think, is Polly Murray in a nutshell. And it's, it's her visionary pragmatism that is inspiring to me and that I hope will become more widely known because of the work that we are doing together at her house. So thank you for uh, attending this talk and for watching online. And I think we should have time for questions. Oh, sorry. In addition to thanking the audience, I'd also like to thank the people who got me involved in this project, the people who've worked with me on this project, um, because it takes, it takes many hands, and I'm really grateful to be working with all of you. Thanks. We have time for questions, if anybody has a question. So do you know if the house originally had indoor plumbing or any of the brick structures you've uncovered related to an outhouse of any kind? So um, there are, let's see, a couple of outbuildings, whoops, on the Sanborn map. Whoops. Okay, figure out the right buttons. I think those correspond to a stable. Whoops. found what's possibly a well house. Uh, the shed addition contained all of the plumbing. Um, so, and, and that was, de that was added after, afterwards. And what I want to do next is to look at, at Heather's report and look at um, the other notes and try and figure out when that actually came into the house. Do you have, oops, do you have information about that it's when you were witnessing the deconstruction of the shed edition, Barbara? Not, spe not specifically, but we do know that they didn't have indoor plumbing while Polly lived there in terms of not before 1926, 1927. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps we could figure out a way to go back and find their water bills mm -hmm. uh, as a way to understand that, but we we, the plumbing that we took out was mm -hmm. modern plumbing, very minimal. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, one of the shirts that I showed you all was a chamber pot room. I didn't mention that at the time. But. I have a question. Um, yeah. You said that uh, the possible well, or the, the well was uh, condemned, and mm -hmm. you have a location for a possible well. Mm -hmm. um, do you, when was the cemetery established, and do we know when the well was formally de, um, condemned, and where they got their water from after right. that? Right. I'm just trying to find the map so that I can bring that up while we're talking. Oops. Right, so we discovered that through probing, actually, Eric did that work. Um, and so your question was? Do we know when the uh, cemetery was established and when they formally condemned the well and where they got their water from mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. that point? My understanding is that the, the extension of the cemetery that close to the house is a result of the Fitzgerald family um, having to sell some of that land. And I don't know the date of that off the top of my head. 
It was. Mm -hmm. So Maplewood Cemetery was established, I think, in either 1873 or 1874, but the oldest parts of it are way up the hill. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen a map that shows when the progression came down the hill. And we don't, um, again, I'm not sure the records in Durham go back far enough for us to know if there was actually a letter of, con of condemning the well. Um, we may, I think it, it may have happened while Polly was living there. Mm -hmm. So that would mean after 1914. Okay. Well, anyway, the story from grandma uh, needing w clean water because she had pellagra, uh, Polly tells stories about, right, going mm -hmm. up the hill toward uh, Vicker Street to a well that was up there for that clean water and having to carry it back every day. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the buttons. Mm -hmm. Were they shell buttons, uh, iron buttons? Uh, what, what were the composition of the buttons? The majority of them are plastic, actually. Right, so ear early plastic buttons. Um, the, the shirt buttons are shell. I don't think there are many bone examples and some, some prosser buttons, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, on behalf of the Office of State Archaeology, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and thank you all for joining us. Yes, um, please, thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. Uh, please join us next month back over at the Archives Building on uh, Tuesday, July 16th for a uh, 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 a talk by Dr. Nora Reber from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington who will be talking about uh, residue studies and an res residue analysis from pottery at uh, Fort Anderson, Brunswick Town. So thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm.